Welcome to Military Faith and Spiritual Resilience. This is Elizabeth Fulgaro. With me is Erin Nichols, nutritional coach and Gold Star wife. Erin, thank you for being with us again. Thank you. You've been sharing the story of your life with Sam, your husband, and your life as Erin, and where God has been in it for you. And in the last episode, you were sharing about some things you learned about your faith and really growing in faith uh, in Bethesda and then also at the Palo Alto VA. But we'd really like an update on Sam now and how he's doing. So can you take us back to Bethesda, where last we knew he was comatose at the deepest levels of coma? And what happened next that got you to Palo Alto and where God was in it? So kind of the first big positive step that happened was the uh, surgeon came in to talk about his right leg. So his right leg, he'd, he lost about a half of his calf muscle, and then there was a big gouge on the front of his shin, and he lost a, a big piece of his, his fibula. And there's all sort of like necrotic tissue and everything, and twice a week they would take him to the OR and like surgically wash out the wounds. Oh my! Um, and so the surgeon, you know, he'd been the, he'd been in there. I want to say they did this on like Tuesdays and Fridays. So he'd been then. Uh, so this was a Thursday. He'd been he'd seen the leg on Tuesday. Friday he's going back in and he's basically saying, "There's too much dead tissue. Um, if it goes any longer, it's going to spread." And Fine. my recommendation is to amputate below the knee before this spreads and becomes something else we're having to fight. So he's talking about the like an infection spreading yeah. because of the dead tissue. And where are we in the timeline? Because he was injured at the end of July. So where are we approximately now? Probably a week or two into August. This might have even been the same day. Of that the, you came to faith in God. Yeah, this I, oh my this my I think this was the, it was a it was a big day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure this was the same day. Okay, so yeah, because it was just my father in law and Uncle Greg and I, and so you know the doctor tells us this, and you know it's like all right, well if he's got to have no leg, he has to have no leg. That's kind of like the least of our worries right now. So I signed the consent form for his right leg to be amputated below the knee or or wherever it was going to need to be amputated, but Ooh. that was the plan. Um, so the doctors leave and uh, Uncle Greg and... So, you know, I, I grew up Catholic, which I mentioned, and prayer is much more of a... Uh, community thing like the priest prays you say prayers in um what are they, choral right like in unison together um typically catholics aren't like extemporaneous prayers right um you 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 uh say the our father you know you you know bless us O lord for these like gifts before you're about to you know before you're about to eat or something like that but that's pretty much where it ends with with out loud praying as a Catholic in 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 my experience growing up. And so I had no idea like how to pray for something like this. And out loud and was super self-conscious about it. Uh Uncle Greg, uh Eric, my father-in-law, not so much. And so they're kind of teaching me like how to do this. And so uh I learned about the laying on of hands like right then and we all three of us had our hands on his leg as much as we could with the like bandaging and everything that was there. Um, and we prayed over his leg that uh, that the you know, by the next day, the doctors would see see fit to keep it, that it would be a healthy enough leg that they couldn't take it. And so this OR time was at like six o'clock in the morning that the next morning that they're going to go in. So, Friday morning, I'm expecting to walk in to one foot. Oh, sure. And there were two. Oh, my goodness. They didn't take the leg. They didn't take the leg. And then after that, it really seemed to progress. Um, as he was slowly starting to progress and become just more medically stable, he was moved from the third floor ICU up to the med surge unit on the fifth floor, which... 
going from the third floor to the fifth floor is like a big graduation. It's a big deal um, there at that hospital. And it's just like the the sun is no longer being blocked. It's just, it's brighter. It's cheerier. You get visitors, you get famous visitors there, all that kind of things. Um, and obviously it means that you're no longer in the ICU and he's improving quite a bit. Good things. You also, yeah. And there's also a, a really nice family room too. And you start to get a little bit more of that community feel of, of the other families. Um, uh, as well. So they ended up doing a skin graft on that leg. So what they did was they, he had injuries to both sides of his lower leg. So they basically just sutured up the calf side of it. So the bottom side of it, which kind of splayed open the top a little bit more, right? Sure. And, uh, so that shin needed a skin graft and then his right hip, which he had lost a lot of tissue in his right hip, uh, needed a skin graft as well. So they took the skin graft from his healthy left thigh, skin grafts from his he- healthy left thighs, and uh, they took really well. And Fabulous. I, I remember this doctor huh. coming in, and uh, he was a he was a surgical resident, and I, I can picture him standing there. <laughs> he was wearing green scrubs because surgeons wear green. Wearing green star- scrubs, standing with his hands on his hips, looking down at his work. Oh. And he's he's staring at Sam's shin and seeing the skin graft taking to oh, his exciting. leg. And going from the point of they almost amputated that leg to now the skin graft is taking and it looks really good. And he's just like, look what I did. That's <laughs> my work. And that was my first thought of like, nah, man, that was God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Prayer is answered. Yes. Prayer is answered. Yeah. So in addition to that physical healing, uh, that kind of obvious he- healing of the leg, um, we we're also seeing start, starting to see some neurological improvements. So one of the big things that uh, other people would notice this, not me so much, is I would move, I would go from one side of the bed or the room to the other side, and Sam's eyes would slowly track and find me. Oh, my. So, he was technically still asleep, but so his he's So not. his eyes would open. Okay. Um, there's a period, uh, they call it doll eyes, actually. Um, and it's really kind of creepy. Like if he gets moved or something or bumped, sometimes the eyes will open and then they're just open hmm. and he's not blinking like nothing. And it's like, it's like a doll with the eyes that open yeah. and close. And then sometimes, you know, you move them again and they close. And so it's not like a purposeful thing or not. They have to constantly put like this, like lubricant in the eyes too, so they don't dry out. And then it got to the point where he actually started to blink. Oh, and wow. Um, and then even to where like you would, his eyes would be open for a really long time and he'd be like blink and then he would blink. And so that was one of the first things he could do kind of on command. <laughs> Actually, I think the first thing he did on command was wiggle his ears of all things. Oh. <laughs> and which was a joke. It was, I think it was his mom and me and, and, uh, we were like joking around and, and said something about, you know, can you wiggle your ears? And he did. Oh, um, which, how was that for you? Oh, well, first oh my of all, goodness. I don't know why he had been saving that trick because <laughs> I didn't know he could wiggle his ears. <laughs> how was that not part of the wooing process? <laughs> Just too charming. <laughs> I, yeah, I, you can only take so much. Um, so, yeah, so that was really, really cool. And the other thing was is he was so injured. So the the brunt of the brain injury was on, was on the right side of his brain. The right side of your brain controls the left side of your body. So he basically had no neurological connection to the left side of his body. So even the left, even though the left side was not injured, he couldn't, he had left side paralysis. Makes sense. His right side, he had, he had like motor control, like the connection was there, but that was the injured side. Oh, so it can't do as much. So there was, there was hardly anything that he could physically do. Right. So he had... Um, he had the two breaks in his right arm. The one was his upper arm, and they just left that one uh, to heal on its own. But he had to have surgery on his elbow, and they put they put pins in his elbow. And then they had him in this, like, it kind of looks like a giant Lego made out of foam. 
So there's different like holes and stuff in it. And then they could use that to position the arm in the way that they wanted to position it for, for healing. So this yellow piece of foam, his fingers just kind of folded over the very top of it. And so after he had his surgery, he started getting occupational therapy and they would come in and start doing like range of motion on his wrist and his fingers and start stuff like that. And, and once they had kind of started waking that up, we started to get a little bit of movement in his fingers. So he's still semi-comatose or comatose? So they're doing the occupational therapy on him, but mm -hmm. it's helping wake him up. Is that right? Somewhat. Yeah, so, so, so explain it. Yeah, so the difference between officially being in a coma and officially not yes. being in a coma yes. is a very fine line. Okay. So like there's okay. there's very little difference. So, you know, they call it emerging <laughs> consciousness. So they they look at your visual response, your verbal response, which, by the way, if you have a breathing tube in, you can't talk. Right, right. <laughs> very, very difficult. Um, and your physical response, like, can you follow commands? Okay. So then they, they're, it's, it's called the Glasgow, what, what they initially use is called the Glasgow Coma Scale. And so that's, those are the three areas that they're measuring. And I believe, according to that scale, eight is like the threshold. So three is the lowest you can be. Um, and then eight is basically three means you get one point in those three categories. And one point means you didn't do anything. Oh, wow. So I don't get zero points, which is Interesting. generous. Yeah. Um, and so then eight is like that threshold of like you're officially not in a coma. Eight's still not great, though. Like you're not doing a lot if you're an eight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or a nine or a ten. Um, but they do stop using that scale at that point, and they start using a different scale called the Rancho Los Amigos Consciousness Scale, I think. Um, it's named after a rehab hospital in Rancho Los Amigos. Um, and it has more to do with your with your behavior and reactions and stuff like that. Um, so, and I was, I was just learning all of this stuff at that time. But what that meant in terms of what Sam was doing yes. was that... His eyes, as I mentioned, were slowly starting to track. So exciting. Um, he had a harder time just neurologically tracking to the left. Like he could get from, if he's looking to the right, he could get his eyes to like straight ahead, but then he couldn't get actually to the left of midline. Um, and then he was able to start doing things like blink when you told him to blink, <laughs> wiggle his ears, um, <laughs> and then starting to be able to like move his fingers. Class. And then even things like, um, <laughs> there was this one corpsman who I could picture, cute little blonde, and whenever she came in, it just seemed like every time she came in, something painful was going to happen. Oh, um, <laughs> poor Sam. Like if, if she was there, like they're going to have to move him or whatever. And um, and so I was like, oh, here comes here comes HN, whatever her name was, you know, you know, flip her off or something like that. And he just barely lifted his middle <laughs> finger, like just, you know, three millimeters but it was there. Yeah, and so that. we started to see that little bit of movement. Of, he was understanding what we were saying. And then the little bit of physical movement he could do, he was responding um, in that way. So um, that was probably about the time that you came and uh, and got to meet us. Yeah, that was a, that was a very special God-arranged time. That was a Holy Spirit setup because I had gotten an email forward to pray for Sam, I didn't know you, and I'd gotten that probably around the 27th, probably about the time that you were traveling to Germany, mm. your anniversary. Mm -hmm. And so I'd just been praying with you, and then when I found out I was coming to Washington, D.C., specifically to uh, bring music, encouraging music, praise music, and a patriotic song to military, um, it seemed right to try to find you. And so it was very special to be able to visit you and Sam and to be able to play worship music in his room. And we all surrounded him and got to pray for him. Mm -hmm. So it was really a wonderful thing. And then you and I have had the pleasure of being able to stay in touch ever since. That's amazing that this is the first time it's been like 14 years since we've been, almost exactly, actually, since we've 
seen each other in person, but we've maintained contact. We have. So how did you end up back in California? How did you get there? It was, it happened really fast. So I, I think just the timing, I think it was literally within a week probably of when you came to see us. And just all of a sudden, the doctor comes in and he's like, yeah, I'm getting ready, getting ready to put together your transfer papers to go to rehab. Like, wait, wow. what? <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, I think it was actually that same surgeon, the so proud of himself and his and his skin graft surgeon um, who did it. And he said he had to go back down to the ICU to get some sort of information uh, in, in preparing the transfer package. And he asked somebody down there um, about Sergeant Nichols. And their response was, Nichols is still alive. Oh, my goodness. And they were getting ready to send him to rehab. That's... Uh... It is so miraculous. Yeah. It is so miraculous. Yeah. So at that point, kind of where he was, uh, kind of like his biggest trick, I used to call him his tricks, because <laughs> it was like it was like getting him to perform, you know? So whether it was a family member who was coming to visit or the doctors coming in, it's like, all right, you got to perform your tricks so they can see what you're capable of, kind of. And so at that point, his, his arm had been healing from after the surgery. He was out of whatever like restriction, movement restriction he had been in. And if I held up his arm, so if I grabbed him by like the wrist, the forearm, and I bent his arm and said wave, he could kind of move his fingers to wave. Which is amazing, right? Yeah. Based on where you'd been. And now are we where are we in the timeline? Where are we? So I believe mid September. So we were in we were in Bethesda for seven weeks. Uh, total. So I think it was about mid-September. And I, I think we had like 24 hours notice. It was really fast. That's really fast. And um, I had accumulated a lot of stuff because oh. people were just giving us stuff. So we had to take a, take a bunch of stuff. Like we had a bunch of like quilts and DVDs, like all sorts of stuff, stuffed animals, Got a got to meet a Medal of Honor winner. Had a book signed by a Medal of Honor winner. Um, all sorts of stuff that people had given us. And you know, took it to somebody downstairs in the hospital somewhere to ship it and to have it shipped to my parents' house or his parents' house or something. Um, and just packing up all of our stuff. I'd been living out of a, in a hotel room for seven weeks. So, you know, it probably wasn't like the tidiest um, that it could be. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just super fast. Actually, my, so my aunt was there, my aunt Joy, who was a, a career Air Force wife, uh, her husband was a fighter pilot. She and my mom were both there at that time. And we hadn't gotten to see DC. We'd been in oh, uh, my word. We'd been in Bethesda uh, a few times. And so, you know, we kind of like did all the stuff we needed to do. And um, maybe we had like two days or something like that. But we ended up, we we got on the metro and went in. It was really hot. And um, we didn't have a lot of time to do anything. So basically all we ended up doing was we paid for one of those like trolley bus tour thingies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And based on the time that it was and the time that they closed, we didn't even have time to get off because you're supposed to like hop off at a stop and go see the thing. And then you wait for the next one and you hop on and like, it's this really great deal. But we just paid a lot of money to just basically take like a tour on this trolley <laughs> and then get back because it was based on um, like the last train that was going to take us back to Bethesda. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Um, and then the next day is when we left. So that was another medevac. Um, so my aunt would have gone home. My mom would have gone home commercial. And then I flew commercial with Sam. And you, I, fl you flew commercial? Uh, uh, not commercial. Sorry. <laughs> just, that would have been. I was like, yeah, that would have been that? interesting. <laughs> no. Um, really good flight attendants. No, uh, yeah, it was another medevac, um, and we flew into Travis, stayed the night there, and then we're taking, we're went in a uh, ambulance down to Palo Alto. Thank you, Erin. Let's continue this next time.